able to make it earlier, but I'm here now. Yeah. tried doing it and I realized when I was like a few hours in that like there's a part of me that felt like if it wasn't going to happen that it would just it would like affect my my immuna kind of and I just stopped because like, I didn't want it to, to do that like I felt like I would have been too upset if it didn't work uh -huh, I, I just didn't uh -huh. want that so I was curious also if there's some there's something that's more not a breast love thing but something that's more like uh, mainstream that's like Mikopola, like a thing that you could do that's like yeah, so, uh, you know, I always have to repeat the question uh, to be sure that people hear it online. Uh, there's a number of questions regarding tefillah. Uh, one is uh, that um, Shmaryo says that uh, the more he davens, uh, the more angry he gets at God because he feels that God, Hashem, is not answering him, and uh, therefore he gets frustrated. Uh, he mentioned uh, a breastlift practice, uh, that if you daven six hours straight uh, without any break, that's a tremendous segula. And uh, you uh, tried it, but you called off the experiment uh, in the middle because uh, you were afraid that if, God forbid, it wouldn't work, uh, it would even have a more devastating effect. And B'chalal, how do we deal with the idea that, um, you know, we daven, Hashem uh, does not always seem to answer our tefillahs. And what does that say about tefillah generally and, and, and the like? So first of all, it's interesting that, you know, just a little comment, you know, Breslov mentioned six hours. Uh, you know, the Vilma Gaon writes, it's interesting, uh, maybe he was directly sp speaking about that practice. He says that how important davening is, and davening is not Bittal Torah, God forbid, but one shouldn't daven more than three hours a day. So he actually gives a number of three hours, but davening, not uh, six hours, because at some point it becomes a Bittal, a bittal Torah. But I think, you know, the understanding is the, really the famous remark of the Panevich Rav. Somebody asked the Panevich Rav, in Yiddish it sounds better, Farvus er entfert nicht, which in Yiddish means, uh, why does God not answer me? So the Panevich Rav says, you put, you're putting your comma on the wrong part of the sentence. Er entfert, he answers, comma, nicht, no. In other words, instead of saying, why doesn't he answer, he answers, no. Now you might say, well, you know, what are you playing semantic games where you're moving the comma? You're like, what, what, what difference does it make? But the truth is there's a tremendous difference. When you say God doesn't answer me, you're saying he ignores me. I don't count. I don't matter. He doesn't care. That's very, very painful. He answers no is a different thing. He looks at me. He considers me. He looks at my situation. And he determines what is best for me at a given moment in time, which may not be what I want but it's what I need. Now, they, they, not that Mick Jagger is a Makar that I should quote, and I have to say, I've not heard the whole song, I've not heard the song, so <laughs> I have not uh, been over on anything, but I know the line. Uh, you don't always get what you want, but you uh, get what you need, and uh, sometimes Kedusha can come from the most unusual, even Tomei sources, and that is a very, very good line. You know, tefillah is not about getting what I want. I don't always get what I want. And sometimes what I get is things that are very, very hard to be macabre. But they taka are what I need from someone who knows exactly what I need at that time. So you make a big mistake. You know, the Gemara says that there are certain things that are actually sinful. And one of them is called Eon Tefillah. Now, Tosis asks what do you mean? Eon Tefillah, to think deeply about your Tefillah. That's a good thing. It says in the Mishnah we say every day, Eilud Tvarim, that there's no shear, there's no quantity. Eon Tvila. So is Eon Tvila a good thing or is Eon Tvila a bad thing? So Tosos answers uh, quite logically. Eon Tvila in terms of Kavana and Devekus and, and you know, the effort you put into it, that's a tremendous thing. But the Eon Tvila that I got to have my prayer answered. No, I don't have my prayer answered. I get upset. That's a bad thing because you're setting yourself up for failure. 
God does not work for you. God is not your employee to kind of carry out your orders. You don't give orders to Hashem. Mm -hmm. You talk about what you need and you try to develop a connection to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And then you'll see what happens. So you really have to have a different attitude, meaning to say, I, I don't mean to be critical of you, I mean generally, we all have to have a different attitude. That tefillah is not so much about getting specific things from God. It's about connecting to God by describing to Him your struggles and your vulnerabilities. And mm -hmm. that's the real need. That's the real need. The real need is that connection to HaKadosh Baruch Hu that tefillah can, can give you. And if that's the case, then uh, you then get into a modality where you accept what Hashem puts in your life at that point, and you try to understand a, a gamzu, a gamzu latova. And of course, this depends very much generally on having a modality of hakara satov. You know, sometimes we're so focused on what it is that we need that we don't have, and we all have needs, that we don't think about what we do have. And overwhelmingly, you know, you think about, why doesn't God answer me? Well, I mean, look at your life. For most people, I mean, I know sometimes there'll be harder cases. You know, okay, I need 100 things. The Abishter only gives me 97 of them. Well, that's not too bad of a batting average, you know. But we don't focus on the 97 that we have because of the three that, for whatever reason, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is deciding that we don't have at the time. So the more you have HaKara Satov, I think the less angry you're, 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 going, you're going to be. But it is interesting that even the Vilna Gaon, you know, the ultimate Litvak, the ultimate Masmid, the person who learns 22 hours a day with only four naps of a half an hour uh, each, did say that up to three hours of tefillah is a good thing. <laughs> so he didn't say six, but he said three. So uh, it's not a bad thing to be marich and tefillah in that way. Yeah. <coughs> Is there a concept brought down from the Sfarim or Gemaras that Nishamos choose their destination before they're born, so to speak, into a body? Um, and if so, like I've heard something where it's like Nishamos choose their parents, for example. And then sometimes that person might even have like, how do we reconcile the fact that that person might have like a, like a machlokus with their parents throughout their lives? Yeah, or yeah, yeah. This is a, an amazing thing. I believe uh, it's Rabbeinu Bechaya his famous commentary on the Torah in Zeis HaBracha, the very end of the Torah. Rebbein HaBachaya says that before a neshama is born, it's like uh, going to buy a car. The neshama looks at the different possible lives it might have, and the neshama makes a choice. Now again, it's not clear, uh, is the neshama, does, does the neshama have absolute discretion, or you know, Hashem you know, gives you certain options, so to speak. Uh, but there is indeed a teaching of Rabbeinu B'chayah, which is based on Kabbalah, that the neshama chooses its life. Now, you may say that's a very odd situation because so many lives are filled with pain. So many lives are filled with difficulty. We often think, including conflicts with our parents, we often think, oh, if only I would have you know, a different set of parents or different community. Or even a simple, even a simple question like, you know, uh, hey, an neshama is holy. Why would an neshama be choose to be born in a non-religious environment, right? I mean, she'll choose to be, uh, you know, a meyasharim, whatever, whatever it would be. And the answer is, you see a very profound idea here, that all of those trials, all of those difficulties, is what my neshama needed. My neshama needed it. I needed to be in that journey. I needed to be in South Dakota, or I needed to be in LA, and not in Meisharim, for those number of years. And uh, that was part of my journey. It's quite, quite amazing. It's a remarkable idea that all of the things that we think we had to avoid and not go through, or wish we didn't have to go through, we needed to go through, and that brought out the potential of our neshamas to accomplish what it is that we are supposed to accomplish. Now, we have to factor in Bechira. That means the following. Um, everything I was put into, I chose and I needed that. But that doesn't mean I make the right choices in how I respond. I mean, there are plenty of people who may make choices which are totally destructive, totally bad. Uh, and, and those were not the things their neshama chose. The Nechama chose the, the environment over which there was no Bechira involved on a human conscious level. 
but how you then choose to respond is your responsibility, and we can make bad choices. There's no question we can make bad choices. Uh, but that's a separate issue. But at least potentially, anything over which we did not exercise Bechira as a human being, our neshama chose that would be the best for us. So what's important to think about is this, you know, um, just to make it um, in the realm of psychology. You know, you come to Yerushalayim, and uh, you know, some, many of you are relatively new to learning, but even someone that's learned for a long time, it's very easy to get an inferiority complex, right? You're invited to a house for Shabbos, and uh, not only does, does the six-year-old speak much better Hebrew than you, or me, speak, uh, you know, on a good day I can, I'm as good as an 11-year-old, uh, but, you know, they know Gemara and all sorts of stuff, and, you know, and you're thinking to yourself, and I'm going to have to learn, like, for 25 years to know what this, maybe six-year-old's an example, to know what this 13-year-old knows. And you kind of, you know, feel very inferior that I come from wherever I come with my background, but you have to know that the same way that the Mea Sharim person, who comes from 50 generations of great rabbis, has something that you don't have, you have something they don't have. The uniqueness of your experiences are designed to bring out a special quality in your neshama. And it's not that, you know, that's good and you're second rate. Rather, you're first rate in a different way. HaKadosh Baruch Hu needed you to go on that particular path, and your neshama, which after all is of the essence of God, made the choice that this is the road that will optimize my growth as, as a person. So uh, again, it's an amazing Rabbeinu B'chaya in that way. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to circle back to two things that you mentioned uh, previously that I didn't understand. The first one is, in terms of prayer, um, that um, you, you can't govern for something to change. Maybe I just didn't understand what you, what you were explaining. Um, that doesn't help to govern for something because it, you, Hashem, you can't get Hashem to change his mind. Maybe I just misunderstood it. And the other thing is, in terms of we were discussing um, some of the things being terrible in the, in the, in the, in the Quraishis, I've heard quoted that uh, Adam and Eve was, was a parable. How, how does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, so uh, your question about when I said you can't pray for certain things to change, I, I'm not sure exactly uh, what you're referencing. I mean, the one thing I can think about is, one example is the Mishnah in Brachos that says you can't pray to change the past, meaning the, 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 the Mishnah gives an example. If you hear, you know, you walk into a town, and as you approach your neighborhood, you hear a scream that somebody is being har har harmed. So if you pray, may it be your will, Hashem, that it not be my family, uh, that's a tefillat shav. That's a prayer that's, uh, by definition, uh, a wasted prayer, because whoever it is, it already is. First of all, b'chlal, it's interesting that you shouldn't necessarily pray. It shouldn't be your family simply because that means it'll be somebody else's family, right? So, okay, but p putting that aside, uh, the prayer is not going to be effective because that's called tzoek l'sha'ovar. Now, there is a machlokas, uh, is it soek l'sha'avar if, if it's already happened, but nobody knows it happened? And an, an example would be, uh, can I pray, let's assume that my, my grain was harvested, and I don't know how many bushels are in the granary. So once I know there's 100 bushels, I cannot pray, Hashem, please make it 105 because I know it's 100. But let's assume I didn't measure it yet. Can I pray, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you know, whatever it is, can you make it more than it is? So that's, that's a machlokas. Is that called a past event that already happened? Or is that called an event that's not yet begoloi, and therefore it's shayach to ask Hashem for a miracle? This is sometimes an approach that posts can take regarding genetic testing of defects. Uh, now, obviously, any type of defect that is correctable by medical science, you should check out and have it corrected. But let's assume, right, this happens a lot. Uh, women are pregnant, they have all sorts of tests, they have ultrasounds, they have different genetic testing to uncover things like Down syndrome or other types of genetic illnesses, which they can't do anything about. I mean, once, I mean, it's just a condition. 
So the question is, is it Kedai, is it permitted, is it proper to check it out? So there are some poskim that say it is better not to check out something which cannot be corrected. Because once I check it out and chas v'shalom, it says Down syndrome, that's not going to change. Hashem is not going to change that. Because that would be an open miracle. And the principle of Tzoyek L'Sha'avar says you can't really ask Hashem to change the past. But until I know that there's a problem, even though it's already happened, in a sense, it's still Shaykh Tefillah. So some postcom will actually tell you not to do genetic testing for things that are not correctable. Others will say, you know, Lamayin Afkamina, it happens, it happens, and the like. Right? So that, that is a machlokas. Uh, but other than that, once something is Yadua, you can't be mispalo. Now, Rivyakra Kamenetsky had a very interesting approach to this. Let's assume somebody is suffering from a disease that based, let's say advanced cancer, based on medical science is not curable. There's nothing they can do. So what do you do? Are you Ms. Palel that Hashem should just take away the, the <laughs> cancer? Right? So many say, well some say, particularly Breslev Hasidim say, be Ms. Palel for a nice, be Ms. Palel for a miracle that the cancer should go away. Others take the position that it's not proper to be mispalel for an open supernatural miracle. Uh, but Rav Yaakov Kamineski said, be mispalel that they discover a cure. Because cures are discovered, and Rav Yaakov made the point, since Hashem never gives you a, ref uh, a maka without a refua, there is in the world some mitzias of cure. And praying for a cure is not in the nature of a miracle because that is the normal process of medical science in which we do discover cures for diseases. So to pray for spontaneous remission of cancer would be praying for a nice nigla, which some say is not a proper subject of tefillah, but to pray for refuah, well, he gives two reasons why it's good. Number one, refuah is called derech hateva, and number two, Refua, this is also very important, Refua benefits everybody, not just your case. When I pray for spontaneous remission, I'm praying for my chola. When I pray for Refua, I'm actually praying for all cholim that suffer, and that itself is a great, great tzuchus. Uh, I'm sorry, your second point was what? Um, uh, how I understand the parable. Oh, yeah, yeah, the issue of parable. Uh, this is um, a difficult issue, meaning uh, are we permitted to say that any particular part of the Torah of Hashem is meant to communicate a parable, a mashal, and is not meant to be taken literally? Now, obviously, it seems pretty, pretty clear that at least from Avram Avinu onwards, we do very much believe in the historicity of the events of the Torah. There was an Avram, there was a Yitzchak, there was a Yaakov, there was a Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. And even though there are modern academic scholars, some of which are even in left-wing orthodoxy, that even talk about the Ovos as mythical, archetypical figures, uh, that's certainly not our, our belief system. We believe that the Jewish people, other than Gerim, are physically descended from human beings. Uh, who were of the name of Avram and Sora and Yisroch and Rivka and Yaakov and Rachel, Leah, Bila and Zilpah. So I think once you get to Avram Avinu, less Mandapalik, there is no source that would allow you to apply metaphorical interpretations, even though I'll tell you that even in the left-wing modern Orthodox world or open Orthodox world, they do that even there, but that would not be acceptable. The main issue, however, deals with uh, particularly Adam Bechava in Yonim of Brias HaOlam, the creation of the world, and the story of Adam and Chava in Gan Eden, maybe even extending to Noah and the Mabel, but, but let, let's talk about Adam and Chava, the Garden of Eden, and, and the like. There, uh, it is understood that there's a lot of mystery there. What exactly is the Eitz Hadas? Was there a talking Nachash? Uh, what does the Nachash represent? Was the Nachash an actual animal? Was the Nachash the koach of evil that is pictured uh, as, as a Nachash? So here, uh, even here, even here, most um, Mepharshim cer um, certainly understand it in a very literal 
sense, understanding that there are deeper meanings. First of all, I do want to point out that the issue uh, is the Torah history or metaphor in a way is a false dichotomy because it's not history or metaphor. Sometimes history is metaphor, meaning to say things happened literally, but they do represent deeper spiritual truths. That for sure is the case. That for sure is the case, that Avram Yitzhak Yaakov represents spiritual forces, etc. So history and metaphor do coexist, but the question you're asking is, are there cases where it's only a mashal and it's not meant to be, to be literally. So the truth is, uh, there are some sources that indicate, in the Mori Nevuchim, the Rambam suggests the possibility, now he doesn't say yet that it is, but he suggests the possibility of metaphoric interpretation. Uh, so uh, even then, if you're asking me, can I point to a Rishon that definitively says something is a metaphor in my Sebracious, I cannot. But I can point to Rishonim that say that this is a legitimate possibility of interpretation. And that would be various passages in the Marina Vuchim. But then these days, if it is quoted as that, is that is it closer to the base on a real... There's no one that said it, but it is a possibility. Well, it is once again, it, seem, it seems to me that the, defi the definition of saying that something is a legitimate possibility, I think definitionally that means it wouldn't be apicorous to, to describe it that way. Mm -hmm. because, because then you would be making it an illegitimate possibility. So as a result, even if there's no Rishon that endorsed it, but if a Rishon said it is a, an interpretive possibility, I think that takes it out of the category of apicorous. Nevertheless, um, I would say this, for me to interpret something in a way that the Rishonim did not openly interpret, I, in my own humility, I have to say that I, you know, I'm very prone to error, meaning to say, it's not apicorsis, I don't think it's apicorsis, but, but I think I would have to say that. Who am I to come up with something that was not embraced by the great, great Rishonim that came before me? In fact, I'll say something that you, you may, you know, uh, you may, again, I may, 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 may get my hate mail uh, for. That is, people sometimes say, well, only the Rishonim could say it, we cannot. Well, I will tell you something that may sound very, very radical, but I don't think it's that radical. If a Rishon said you are allowed to interpret something, then that means I am allowed to interpret it that way, I, that by definition. There's no such thing as a Rishon license. There's not like a license that said, oh, you're a Rishon, therefore. The Rishonim explained to us what is legitimate interpretation, what is not legitimate interpretation? If a Rishon said this is a legitimate way of interpreting the Torah, then it's legitimate for me as well to interpret the Torah. The only thing is, I'll repeat what I just said, the fact that the Rishonim were so much greater than I, and they did not employ that interpretation for a certain part of the Torah, should be a signal to me that I shouldn't employ it, but not that it's illegitimate, just that it's wrong. Plenty of things are wrong, which are not apicorsis. I've said uh, you know, a million times that uh, being stupid is not apicorsis. It's just being stupid. Uh, so I could say all sorts of wrong things, but that does not mean I'm a co fair and that does not mean an apicorsis. It just means that, hey, you know, I ought to be a little more humble and know that my pshat is probably not right if the great, great people who came before me didn't say it that way. So I know that um, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, Zechariah uh, Levracha, again, sometimes controversial uh, in the uh, yeshiva show world, uh, does make a lot of, uh, he writes quite a lot about the story of Adam and Eve being metaphorical. Uh, the truth is, his proposition is not well supported if he means that commentaries actually say it. But he does have support that commentaries say it's the Rambam, it's a legitimate possibility of interpretation. So that much uh, is, is sourced. Yeah. Uh, here's a sentence. For a new person interested in Yiddishkeit, how much can we bend or withhold halacha? For example, if he wants to start keeping Shabbos, do we tell him everything at once, each malacha, etc., or start slowly and introduce everything over time? 
Yeah, uh, this is a really, really uh, excellent, very, very important practical question. That is, somebody's new to Yiddishkeit, they're exploring, they're getting their feet wet, uh, and uh, they want to start keeping Shabbos. So what do I do? Do I tell them everything they're not allowed to do on Shabbos right away? Or do I feed them information gradually and perhaps uh, deliberately withhold certain information? So, so, so again, I can't lie, that's for sure. I, uh, but, you know, but don't tell them about uh, the toilet paper or whatever, whatever, whatever it, it would be. Now, the pashtas is, when you first approach this from a pure halachic standpoint, you say, well, gee, uh, how can I not tell the Jew all the information? Um, I'm causing them to sin. Uh, if I'm not telling them what is forbidden and they think they can do all these things, then I'm goreim uh, averos. And is it not lifneiver lo sitein michshel? Is it not putting a stumbling block in front of a blind person? You know, quite literally, in the sense that I'm facilitating avera. So that would be the argument that once somebody wants to keep Shabbos, you've got to tell them everything. The counter argument uh, is this, that you have to look at the long term. And that is, if by telling a person all of these things, number one, even for the immediate Shabbos, they may not listen to you. But number two, even if they're going to do everything initially, but if they're doing it too fast, if they're doing it beyond their capacity, at some point, they're going to break. At some point, they're going to crash. And when they crash, they will be worse off than they were when they first approached you. So in Lifne Iver, we have to consider not only the immediate effect of what I'm doing, but the long-term impact of what I'm doing. So yes, if I don't give you all the information, I'm causing you to sin on this Shabbos, this Shabbos, or whatever number of Shabbos is. But if this is a structure that is more likely to result in permanent Shabbos commitment, in the long run, it's worthwhile to go slow. Now, the Vilna Gaon in his Parish on Mishli does not explicitly address it in for Chilol Shabbos, actual halakhic violations. But the Vilna Gaon throughout the Sefer Mishli talks a lot about the need to go very slow in spiritual levels, that if you try to do too much at one time, you fail and you lose even the madregos that you have. Uh, the analogy is a building, right? You have a building of a hundred stories. But if you try to build the hundredth story before you have 99 stories, things are not going to stand. And therefore, uh, one of the great responsibilities of anybody who's involved in Kira Verchokim, whether it's within a yeshiva or whether it's with families or whatever, is to gauge what people are ready for and kind of give it to them in the manner that they can assimilate it, they can grow with it, in order that they shouldn't get broken. Now, that's a very difficult decision because sometimes we underestimate what a person is ready for. Sometimes they are ready, right? And we got to have confidence in them that Hashem will help them make the right decisions. So we shouldn't kind of, uh, just like, you know, raising a child, you know, at some point the child is ready to ride the bike without training wheels, right? You don't want uh, a 14-year-old kid to still have training wheels on his bike. You know, you kind of want to progress him to the next level. So that's important too, not to, you know, underfeed the person, but at the same time, not to give them too much. Uh, again, you see this, I mean, listen, mm -hmm. uh, you see this in our yeshiva quite often, uh, in which people try to re reach certain madregos, and then uh, they, they sometimes, I mean, Baruch Hashem, sometimes they're matzliach, other times they crash, other times it's very, very devastating. I mean, I, I still remember it. I, I, was, I was once talking about something about... Uh, you know, that for many people, maybe full-time kolol is not uh, the ideal. They need to have a parnasa. Okay, controversial. So I remember a guy was arguing with me. He says, parnasa, what's it? You have amuna and Hashem? How do you work? Uh, where's your amuna? Where's your thing? Where's your, of course, you don't need parnasa. You don't need a plan. You don't need it. So then I said, I was retreating a little bit. I said, okay, at least you need a plan, you know, something. He said, no, you don't need a plan. You don't need a plan at all. Hashem will take care of you. So I kind of felt like I was the apicorus in the room. <laughs> uh, I have to say, I get no joy in this.
but I believe the person is not even a Shomer Shabbos today because he was setting himself up to the high madrega of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochoi and he really wasn't there. So, now again, I, I, I can only speculate that maybe if he would have been involved in a plan and a parnasa, you know, maybe things could have been different. But, but I think that's an example of a person reaching for a very, very high madrega that can actually be destructive to them. Now, I, I want to say your question is more difficult because here we're dealing with madregos, no kolel versus working. Uh, you're raising a concrete halachic question about kashras. I'm sorry, yeah, yeah, kashras and Shabbos. You know, yeah, so that is more difficult because there you're actually allowing direct halachic violations. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, uh, many say that the same methodology is going to apply in that type of issue as well. Yeah. This is Sandin. I sometimes pray in a Sephardic minion here in the U.S. where I'm the only lady. Their Shemona Esra is a little faster than mine, so I'm, on, so I'm usually unable to wash the hands of the Kwanim because I'm still in Shemona Esra. Is it preferable for me to quicken my Shemona Esra so that I can wash the Kwanim, or better to forego that mitzvah and pray at my normal pace? Again, assume I'm the only lady there. Yeah, so this is referring to, uh, I guess, an Ashkenazi in a Sephardi minion, although I, I, don't, I don't see that as a difference here. And uh, he's a levy, and uh, one of the few uh, honors that Levim still have today is they get to wash the hands of the Kohanim before they duchen. Of course, in Sephardic Minyanim, they duchen every day, even in Chutz Laaretz. The uh, problem is the levy is still davening Shemona Esrei, and therefore he misses the chance. So should he rush his Amida, should he rush his Shemona Esrei to be able to finish in time to wash the hands of the Levium. Uh, I think, by and large, no. I, I think that Fila is more important. Now, if he would be a Kohen, that's an interesting Shaila, because there is a mitzvah to say in the Torah for a Kohen to, to Duchen. Uh, even then, I think there's a strong Svara that he should not uh, uh, hurry up his, his Tefillah. But I think for a Levi, for sure, uh, the Tefillah B'Kavana would be more important. On the other hand, everything depends on a measure of common sense, meaning if he's almost finished and he would just have to speed it up a little bit, uh, maybe a little bit, but if this would be a major impact on his kavana, tefillah b'kavana is extremely important. And uh, if you miss some things, you miss some things. For tefillah, it's kadai to miss. Yeah? Um, this is the um, The Rav often um, mentions the uh, Zohar that says there can be no kapara for um, Zohar Yeah. Um, although the rabbi has also mentioned that there are new issues that, you know, oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. for, um, the person who sent me this question mentioned that he saw a, uh, Yerushalmi in, uh, in Chagiga, uh, I believe he said Chagiga 1 setting, uh, which, which sa says that Hashem can overlook, Hashem can overlook, um, you know, the Gimel Reyes Hamur, so by the Zara, I don't worship, um, Gilarayas, those relationships, and, Murder, Shemitzamin, but not Bethel Torah. Bethel Torah can't be forgiven. This Gemara seems to imply this. This is a Gemara in the Yerushalmi, which was long before the Zayar, and seems to clearly imply that that the only Bethel Torah isn't isn't forgiven. But even the Gimel of Eretz Hamuras and the Kabbalah Chaimer Zera can be forgiven. So how is the Zayar coming later? Yeah, yeah, so the question is, uh, the, the famous uh, passage of the Zohar, that uh, all Averos have tshuva except for the emission of zera, levatala, sperm in vain. Uh, so the question is, uh, the Talmud Yushalmi seems to say that Hashem can forgive every Avera, even Avodah Zorah, Gil Rai except for Bittal Torah, which implies zera levatala would have, uh, would have Shuvah and forgiveness, how can the Zohar argue with the Yushalmi if the Zohar came later? So first of all, depending, you say the Zohar comes later. It depends. If you are a Makabel, that the Zohar is from Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, the Zohar is earlier than the Yushalmi. So their Vada could be a Machlokas in that way. Um, but again, the short answer that I want to bring out is, is what I say often, is the Balatanya's understanding. The Balatanya says that when the Zohar says there is no Shuvah, 
for Hotza Sarah Levatala, it does not mean there is no tshuva. As a Dover Pashut, that tshuva will be a kapara for everything. It just means that tshuva is difficult, it takes a lot of effort. 100% there is tshuva. Now people ask me, oh, well, the Zohar doesn't say that. Okay, it makes no difference. The Balatanya says that's what the Zohar means. I mean, if I, would, if I were to say that's what the Zohar means, you could ask me that the Lushan is not mashma that way. The Balatanya knew the Zohar very, very well. And this is his interpretation of the Zohar. And by the way, that's also the interpretation for the Yushalmi. When the Yushalmi says there's no forgiveness on Bittal Torah, it doesn't mean there's no forgiveness. A person does tshuva for that too. But it means it's a, it's a hard process of tshuva. So Chazal used the Lashon, there's no kapara, to refer to the notion that the tshuva is a difficult, difficult process. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Leif Tar, I haven't been following Leif Tar in, in recent, uh, recent years. Um, there's still a movement Leif Tar around? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I, I don't want to say things because I don't remember the Pratim, but to the degree that there was uh, abuse and all sorts of other things, then it's, it's ricious and, uh, you know, there's no limut zuchus that we should have for, for destructive, pernicious, abusive societies. Now, if you're talking about the way some women dress, like the full uh, body cover, uh, is there a mucker? There actually is a mucker. There, there is a mucker. I mean, the Rambam, uh, in some passages of the Rambam, describes women dressing that way. But the thing to remember is that a lot of the halachas of Sneas depend on what are considered to be the societal norms, meaning halacha has minimum standards. So no matter what society does, you know, a woman's knees have to be covered, you know, that's not going to change if, if society, uh, women wear, wear shorts or whatever it is. But beyond the minimum boundaries, what society, even the goyim, consider to be tsanua, can go beyond the halacha. So the Rambam lived in Islamic societies that had very, very strong standards of tsnias. So that became the way a Jewish woman dresses as well. But when you live in more modern times where lehepech, there's tremendous pretzis. So we can't use pretzis. Okay, let me be sure you understand this. We certainly cannot use pretzis to go beyond our minimum standards. But it does mean we don't have to maximize the standards beyond the minimum. So as a result, the makairis that people bring from the Rambam really would not apply that much in, in modern, modern society. And in fact, some have made the argument that to dress in a way that is conspicuously different than the way Jewish women typically dress is in itself a breach of sneas. Very interesting svara. Because sneas is not only about uncovering body parts, it's about attracting attention to yourself. So if a woman dresses in a super sneasnik way that causes people to stare at her as an odd thing, that itself is a lack of tzniyas. You're drawing attention to yourself. So therefore, Rabbi Yasha, for example, uh, other great gedolim uh, years ago already said this was not a proper hanhaga of a bas Yisrael. Yeah. So one of my friends had to get his tefillin fixed, so he went to the whatever tefillin repair shop and he paid them, and in the meantime, while they were fixing it, they gave him a spare, you know, pair of tefillin. So, what is his status? I'll be that pair, that pair of tefillin. Is he a borrower? Is he a renter? Uh, is he some type of other showman? In other words, uh, he, a person got his tefillin repaired, so he was given a loaner. He was uh, given a uh, another pair of tefillin to wear in the interim. So, in Dine Shomrim. Uh, what is his status? Is he a shoel, that is a borrower, or is he a renter? And there are, you know, nafkaminas. I mean, if, if nothing gets lost, there's no problem. But as you know, a shoel is chayav even for an accident, even if there was a flood, there was an earthquake, there was a tsunami, and the tefillin got swept away, a shoel has to pay for those damages, except for uh, normal 
uh, wear and tear called Mesa Machas Malacha. If, on the other hand, you are a socher, you are a renter, like you're paying it, you rent a car, so a renter is like a Shomer Socher, you're Chayev, you are Chayev for Geneva and Aveda if it gets stolen or lost, but you're not Chayev for what is called an Ones. So the question would be, the guy that gets the loaner tefillin, uh, is he called a Shoel? Uh, or is he called a socher? So the truth is, there are two ways of looking at it. On one hand, you can call him a shoel because he's getting the loaner tefillin for free. He's not paying for the right to use those tefillin. It's being lent to him, which would make him a shoel. On the other hand, it is in the context of a transaction in which he is paying money to get his tefillin, uh, tefillin fixed. But I would say this. I would say that given the fact that intrinsically there is no chiv on the part of the tefillin store to give them a loan or pair. They do it kind of out of the kindness of their heart and also to get business and the like. So I would say I would look at it as a separate transaction. It's separate from the money you're paying to get your tefillin checked. You're not paying any money for the loan or tefillin. So I think you would be a shoel and you would be chayev. Uh, you know, that, that's what I would think. Yeah. Here's a new ascendant. There's a mitzvah stated in many places in the Gemara to respect the wishes of the recently deceased. Does this apply to someone that was killed by a basin or committed suicide? Yeah, uh, by the way, it doesn't have to be recently deceased. Uh, the, the Gemara has a concept of mitzvah l'kayim divrahim eis. There is a mitzvah to carry out the wishes of a person uh, who dies. Uh, that refers specifically, actually, to his property. You know, he left instructions in a will that he wants things to be done with his property. It doesn't necessarily apply to other things. Like if somebody said, I want you to go to this yeshiva as opposed to that yeshiva. You're not mechayiv, like to obey that wish, or I want you to leave yeshiva, or something like that. But legabe, his property, there is a mitzvah l'kayim divrei ames. Uh, so the question becomes, does that even apply uh, to a person who was executed by the Bastin, uh, who was a Russia, who committed a sin, uh, and, 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 and the like. Uh, but Pashtus, the answer is yes, uh, but some would say the following. Some would say that mitzvah l'kayim divrahim eis is a component uh, that applies to children and it's based on kibud of v'yem. It's, it's, it's an expression of honoring parents and therefore you'd have to ask the question, am I m'chuyiv to honor a parent that was executed by Bastin? So that will get you into a machlokas rishenim. Is there a mitzvah of kibbut aviyem on a Russia, on a parent that's halachically a Russia? Some rishenim say yes, some rishenim say no. On the other hand, I'm thinking out loud, even like the opinions that say there is no mitzvah of kibbut aviyem on a Russia, but when the Russia was actually executed, and did shuva before he's, his death. He's no longer a Russia. And as a result, it would seem that there would be kibbut aviyem, and therefore there would be mitzvah l'kayim divrahim eis, even for someone that was executed al pi based in. Okay, yeah. What's the Jewish perspective on potential of alien life and potential of multiple universes and, and those ideas? Yeah, so uh, the question becomes, uh, what does Judaism say about uh, extraterrestrial ter life? whether it's in this universe, like Mars or whatever it would be, or even the very intriguing idea of the multiverse, the multi alternative universes. Uh, so let me first talk about uh, this universe. And you know, can there be life on other, on other planets? So uh, interesting question. Uh, let me point out that the Rambam himself says that the planets themselves uh, can be kind of intelligent life although that kind of, they uh, perceive and understand. Now, scientifically, we would have a lot of difficulty with that, but it would seem that if the planet could be an intelligent life, there could be intelligent life on the planets. Now, the question would be, what is the nature of that intelligent life? Do they have a Torah? Is it a different Torah? Did God give different Torahs to different lives in different planets and the like? Um, it is hard to know, but Papashtus, probably uh, the intelligent life that, it would ex that might exist on other planets would be in the nature of angels. Uh, they probably would not be balei bechira. Uh, they probably would just be angelic spiritual forces that can exist and maybe can communicate, but they would not be mugder with Torah. We seem to understand 
by and large, that there's one Torah. Because remember, we don't make the claim that Torah is only earth. Torah brings tikkunim, rectification, to the universe as a whole, which would imply that there can only be one Torah that does that. Because if you're going to tell me, oh, there's the Torah for Earth and the Torah for Mars and the Torah for Jupiter and the Torah for Neptune, then you could no longer look at the Torah Sashem as being Misak in the whole universe. So I think if we do regard extraterrestrial life, it would be in the nature of Malachim and the like. Now, can there be an alternative uh, universe, multiple universes, a multiverse uh, concept? Um, I think we'd have a lot of difficulty with it. I, I, I'm not clear how we would assimilate an alternative universe into a Jewish uh, religious thought. Because once you're talking about an alternative universe, that would imply alternative everythings, um, which could mean an alternative Torah, which would contradict, once again, the primacy of the Torah as the essence of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. I mean, after all, you're not going to posit in a multiverse different gods. That would be Avodah Zarah. And since the Torah is an expression of God's will, you couldn't really posit alternative Torahs at that point. Now, the multiverse idea is really speculation. I mean, there's no, it's, not, it's not like, for sure, you know, we have a scientific consensus on it. It's speculative thoughts, and we would probably say that that's not the probable direction of where Judaism would go on that particular issue. Uh, yeah, in the back, yeah. Um, in light of the... Uh, the Korach went down to, uh, Korach went down in the pit alive. Does Korach have a share in the world to come? Yeah, so the question is, uh, does Korach have a share uh, in, the, in the world to come? So th there are a number of Mamari Chazal that says Korach does not have a share in the world to come. Uh, on the other hand, I mentioned uh, the Arizal. The Arizal in Kabbalah uh, talks about Korach even coming back with the resurrection of the dead and Korach being Kohen. Uh, in fact, the Arizal is a whole Arichus, that Korach's mistake that he was entitled to Kahuna was jumping the gun in point because he saw with Ruach HaKodesh that he would be Zohar to Kahuna, but it wasn't the right time. In fact, I mentioned on Shabbos that the Arizal says in Mizmer Shir Yoma Shabbos, we have the Pasuk, Tzadik Katomar Yifrach. The Tzadik will flourish like the palm tree. If you look at the last letter in those three words, Tzadik, Kuf, Katamar, Reish, Yifrach, Ches, Kuf, Reish, Ches, spells Korach, that Korach will have a Tikuma, will have a Tikun, even uh, in the Olam HaTechiyah, the Olam of Techiyah Samesim, uh, with Kahuna. So all I can say is there seems to be a big machlokas in Chazal. Now the Gemara in Rav Basra does say that Korach to this very day proclaims from Gehenim Moshe Emes, Vitoraso emes. Maisha is true, and his Tyra is true. But the Arizal seems to look at that as a kind of a zechus that Korach has to be that proclaimer, which will ultimately result in his reunification to Klau Yisrael. Uh, yeah. Let's say, for example, um, someone buys something, and um, he bought from his own free will, and afterwards he regrets. He says, oh no, it was, like, it was a really bad idea for me, for me to buy this. Is he able to apply the idea of Gam Zula to this? Because I'll call it Shemayim, um, so I should want it. Or is um, he not able to apply it because he chose to buy that item with his own free will? Yeah, this is a very, very excellent question. We say whatever God uh, does to me, whatever happens to me, is Latova, is for my positive benefit. What about things that I did as a result of my choice, my Bechira? In other words, uh, the example you gave was, I bought something that turned out to be a really bad investment. The thing was no good for me, etc. So do I say, Kam Zulatova, even if it's something that I don't like, you know, it must be for my good, because everything Hashem does is for my good. Or do I say, no, it's not Kam Zulatova, whatever Hashem does is for your good. This was your decision, this was your Bechira, you have the ability to make bad decisions, right? So it's not shayach a on uh, on something that is a function of your bechira. Again, it is a very very excellent question. Uh, the way Rav Sadok deals with it is really through a paradox. And Rav Sadok basically <coughs> says, 
On one hand, we live in a world, and again, this is not going to make full sense to you because it does not make full sense to me. I, I don't fully understand it. But he says that we live in a world of, which combines free will and divine determinism in the results of your actions. That, yes, prospectively, when I have to decide to do something or not do something, I have free will to go either way. Once it's done, it was the will of God that that happened. So, yes, when I have to decide what I buy, I got to be responsible. I got to think about what the right decision to do, uh, what the right decision is. Once it's done, and it turns out to be negative, I have to look at that as part of Hashem's plan as well. The plan that I would fail, the plan that I would mess up, the plan that I would do something wrong is factored in to HaKadosh Baruch Hu's cheshven. Now this is a big paradox. This is indeed is a paradox because if you're truly you are a master of your fate, then Mimela, if, if there are bad consequences, it's because you made a bad decision. And yet Rav Sadok says, Hashem does not always allow us to act against our interests. So the fact that he allowed your Bechira to be carried out indicates that Hashem had a purpose in that as well. Maybe the purpose is to teach you a lesson not to be irresponsible. That could be the lesson. He wants you to have that mistake so you learn from your mistakes. One could analogize it, give a superficial analogy, to a parent that will let a child do something stupid. So the child chose to do something stupid, but the parent let it happen. Why? Because that is one of the ways we learn. Right? We learn from mistakes that we make. And that's part of Hashem's calculus to let your free will manifest itself in that particular particular way. Which means, it's really a practical question, you make a, you make a mistake, you goofed. So you ask yourself, what does Hashem want me to learn? I mean, that, the, the practical answer is very simple. What does Hashem want me to learn from my goof? And then there's a gamzul latova in it. I've learned something. Right? People say often, that we learn much more from our mistakes than from our successes. And the reason is very simple. If I'm successful, I didn't learn anything because I, that just confirms what I already know. When I make a mistake, I've learned, ah, this is not the right thing to do. Right? So I learn from my mistakes more than I learn from my successes. Yeah? There's another sentence. The rabbi has once talked about why he doesn't necessarily wait for a second person to say Vayachu Hashemayim if he finished davening after the tzibur. Could yeah. the rabbi tell the reason for it and the reason why most people wait to say it with someone else? Yeah, yeah. The idea that uh, after uh, Myra, Friday night, so we say Vayachu uh, and uh, if I say it with tzibur, that's fine, but let's assume I finish Monesre later. So the Mishnah Brewer brings, the Mishnah Brewer brings that it's a proper minog to try to say it with another person. And you go over to somebody else, say it together, even if they already said it, because you're testifying that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is the creator of heaven and earth, and testimony should be with uh, two Adem. So I go over to somebody to make it an Adis. Now, th this is brought down by the Mishnah Brewer, that this is a proper minak. So many, many people are no egg that uh, they want to have Adis. Now, Lemaise, I just want to point out that even like the Mishnah Brewer, you're not really dealing with Hilchais Eidos Mamish. I mean, after all, uh, two brothers cannot be witnesses. Can I say by Yechulu with my brother? The answer is I can. And I don't need kosher witnesses and the like, but okay. So the minag the other way is from the Chazinish. The Chazinish actually says, he's cholik on the Mishnah Bura, and he says that you bedafka shouldn't get another person because that implies there's some doubt that has to be clarified by witnesses. You only have to have witnesses when we're not sure what happens, we have to have witnesses. But the fact that Hashem created the world is so pushed and obvious to us that for me to say, oh, I got to have a, wit a, a witness to affirm it, that's kind of taking away from its truth. So it's really a machlokas, uh, the, uh, the Mishnah Bura and the, and the Chazinish. Yeah. So currently, even my mom and both of my aunts, either because they were widows or they were divorced, are with uh, non-Jewish Christian um, partners. Either they're married, engaged, or in a relationship. So I know yeah. that 
with my mom and both my aunts, I need to, if, if anything, be closer with them than I was before. But regarding the partners that they're with, I, I'm not exactly sure what kind of relationship I'm supposed to have with them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, unfortunately, uh, this is a major problem, um, mainly in American life, or Baruch Hashem in Eretz Yisrael, it's not too big of a problem, and hopefully it should never be a big problem here, but in the United States, intermarriage or the relationship of a Jew and a non-Jew, whether it's in marriage or, or not within marriage, is enormously, enormously big. Uh, in many, many places in the U.S., intermarriage is uh, up to 70%. That means seven out of 10 marriages in which one person is a Jew, the other person is not a Jew. That's mavil, that is terrifying. Uh, because, well, number one, if the woman is not Jewish, the kids are not Jewish. And number two, uh, if the kids are Jewish, it's even worse because they're not going to be raised Jewish, by and large. Okay. So the question that virtually every, fr you know, this is like it says by, by Mitzrayim, by Makas Bechiris, ain bias, asher ain shameis. There was no house in which there wasn't a dead body. Litzarenu hagadol, this is true in the firm world. There's like no family which does not have either immediate or indirect an intermarriage issue of how to be misyaches. Now, uh, your first point is 100% correct. Uh, you need to have a relationship with your aunt, uh, your aunts, uh, your, your mother too, you said. Yeah, of course. And uh, whatever mitzvot you can help them do, whether it's Kiddush or whatever it is, do for them. They're, they're Jewish people. And even if they're doing something that's not proper, that doesn't mean the other mitzvot don't count. And by all means, uh, give, you know, give them chizuk and, and uh, you know, learn Torah with them, whatever, whatever different ways you would interact with them. Uh, in a Jewish setting and as a, in a, fam a familial setting as, as well. So the question becomes, okay, so that's fine. That's how I relate to the Jewish part of the equation. How do I relate to the non-Jewish part of the equation? Do I just ignore them? Do I make believe they don't exist? I walk into my mother's house and there's this non-Jewish guy who happens to live there. Do I say, hi, mom, and just you know, don't even acknowledge. Well, you understand that, you know, maybe in theory that would be the best way, but in practice that's not going to work. Meaning once we understand that you have to have a good relationship with your mother and even with your aunt, then we understand you're going to have to have some relationship with this guy. And in many, many ways, you know, the guy is not a bad guy. I mean, it's not the guy's fault. I mean, they don't think there's anything wrong here. And why should they think there's anything wrong? In fact, it's extremely difficult to make any case against intermarriage uh, that's not based on Torah values. Meaning to say, if someone doesn't keep the Torah, what's my argument why they shouldn't go with the guy? Are we racist? Okay, if you believe in Torah, you believe in halacha, you believe in religion, so okay, these are the halachos that we have to keep. If you don't believe, what am I supposed to tell a non-religious Jew why they can't marry a non-Jew? It's extremely difficult. I mean, there are arguments that are made, but it's extremely difficult to make a secular case against intermarriage. So this guy is not a bad guy, okay? So as a result, I think by definition, you have to be polite. And there's a, you know, a big difference. Before they started a relationship, you try to discourage it. Once it's a fait accompli, you have to accommodate it to a certain extent. Derech Eretz, Menschlichkeit, how are you doing, hello? Try to avoid lishonos that you know, legitimate the relationship per se. Like, you know, don't send them an anniversary card or something like that. You know, don't acknowledge this as a union. But in terms of the derech eretz that you have for another human being, say, how are you doing? You can ask him about uh, his job or his life or, or whatever it is. And in that way, you know, you're making a kiddush Hashem as well. They see that a religious Orthodox Jew treats human beings in a respectful way. And that's kind of the best, the best you can do. But all I'm saying is, if you have a goal that you want to, you know, have a good relationship with your mom or your aunt and maybe bring them to mitzvahs. This is the only possible way that this could be done. So sometimes you do have to accommodate in that way. Let me just point out, I, I mentioned before, 
uh, Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky, you know, the, the minog in Europe was that if, God forbid, a child intermarried, the parents regarded them as dead and they would sit shiva and they would never talk to that child again. That, that's what it was. Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky said that uh, in the 20th century, uh, that is no longer the appropriate response. In Europe, which was largely a homogenous religious society, at least until the 20th century, so somebody who intermarried was going out of their way to rebel, going out of their way to spit on Judaism, going out of their way to reject. So as a result, we pushed them away. Today, intermarriage is not rejecting Judaism. People just don't think it's wrong. So as a result, Rabbi Yaakov said it's important to try to keep a connection to the person, no matter what. And in that way, whatever, you might be an influence uh, for the good. Uh, yeah? Um, a child, or a young adult, young adult that experiences uh, pain before they turn 20, can you attribute that to uh, his future sins, or sins of his parents, or not of a deal book? Right, right. So this is an interesting question. Uh, the Gemara says that based in Shalmala, that, that although in terms of human accountability, as soon as I'm 13, a based in can punish me for my Averos, Malkus, and the like, but Hashem, the based in of Shemayim, does not punish me till I reach the age of 20, uh, because you need a higher level of maturity. So the question would be, well, if that's true, if heavenly punishment do not befall a person until they reach the age of 20, how do we understand the pain and the suffering from Shemayim, whether it's disease or, or even death, that befall a person before the age of 20, since the base in Shomala does not punish uh, below the age of 20? So the answer is uh, everything you said is correct. Uh, number one, there is a concept that they may be punished for the sins of their fathers, parents, but, but I think there's a problem with that, I, I, because it seems like this. It seems that 13 to 20 seems to be a neutral zone, because it seems the concept that you could be punished for the sins of your parents is only until your bar mitzvah. And that's why the parents make the bracha, Baruch Shep Tarani. Now, there are two interpretations. Some say, thank God I'm not responsible for this kid. Like the parent is saying, it's not my problem anymore. But no, some say the other way around. Thank God that my child is not going to get punished for my sins. I like that better. That's a more generous type of bracha. Uh, so according to that, that terrace wouldn't be a good terrace. So to say that between 13 and 20, I'm getting punished for my parents' sins seems to contradict this pshat in Baruch Shep Tarani that I'm no longer going to be punished for my parents' sins once I'm 13. Uh, the other possibility, Gilgal, is indeed possible. Indeed, Gilgal could uh, Gilgal reincarnation, punishment for past Averis, our Shaykh at any age, including birth, right after after birth. Now you mentioned a, a third possibility. Yeah, what would what, for future sins? Future sins like Ben Sower or Mora, in other words, the person is judged uh, based on what he will become. Uh, that's possible, but again, that would be a contradiction with the Ishmael principle of Asher Husham uh, and, uh, and, 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 and the like. Now, it also might be like this. It might be that the rule of Ben Esrim uh, is not necessarily a physical age, but it may refer to a certain state of maturity. So you might have a 15-year-old who in Chachma and understanding is already a Ben Esrim. His neshama is like a Ben Esrim. And perhaps under those circumstances, the Din Shemayim would be Chalanim. Meaning, it's only in Dine B'nai Adam that we look at fixed ages. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is more looking at spiritual age. And spiritual age may be different than physical age. By the way, the Chassam Seifer, interestingly enough, says, under Dine B'nai Nayach, that's exactly how it is. You know, under the Sheva Mitzvah B'nai Nayach, uh, the Chazam Seifer says, and the punishments can be very severe. Violation of the Noahide Code could be capital punishment, like even theft. Says the Chazam Seifer, there is no automatic age of majority. Hakol lefi ha'inyan. There may be an eight-year-old who will be judged as an adult, and there may be a 15-year-old who will still be judged as a katan. So the Chazam Seifer says, the assessment of culpability 
in a Noahide setting is based on spiritual maturity. It's not based on a fixed age. Yeah. <coughs> How was the t how was the tikkun haklali kind of introduced to Rabbi Nachman? And then, are there other um, like formulas of Tehillim similar to tikkun haklali that have other effects? Yeah, yeah. So the uh, tikkun klali, which is meaning the general rectification for sins, for all sins, but specifically for Eitzaser Levatola, are the ch designated chapters of Tehillim uh, that uh, Rav Nachman uh, indicated. Uh, should be said, uh, where did he get them from, and the like. So uh, again, um, it is Kabbalistic. Uh, he was not the total originator. It's based on both Ramak and, and Kisve Arizal, in which certain Tehillim are Masugo. Uh, now, you're asking me, are there other compilations of Tehillim that work for other things? Absolutely so. Many, 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 many. Uh, the Chida, in particular, compiled a whole bunch of different groupings of Tehillim for specific things. And indeed, you can get in many Tehillims. It'll tell you, you know, this chapter, these two chapters are good for this, and these two chapters are good for this. And uh, they're very, very specific. You know, uh, if you have a hangnail, there's something <laughs> you can say. If you have a hangover, there's something else you can say. You know, uh, so over the years, the Mekubalim uh, used Tehillim like uh, almost like chemotherapies, very spe specially targeted medications. But at the end of the day, I want to make a very important point. At the end of the day, it is not so much what you say. It is how you say it. Your kavana is the most important thing in your tomb. People are always asking, what to heal him are good for? And yeah, we can usually find what to heal him are good for this or that. But the truth is, the most important thing is, whatever Tehillim you say, you say it with Kavana. It will bring the mercy of Hashem uh, into the world. So uh, we shouldn't overemphasize specifically what you say. We should emphasize more of the way that you say it and the heart that you bring to it. Yeah. In regards to Kirov, at what stage should you risk your own level of Judaism to help someone else and bring them closer? For example, like if you miss a Gemara Shur to give an inspirational talk, or if you take a care of trip and then you're away from your family, and stuff like that. Yeah, so this is the uh, very, very difficult, important issue of uh, to what degree do I compromise or sacrifice or lose some of my own spiritual growth in order to bring other people to HaKadosh Baruch Hu through Kirov, such as missing a Gemara Seder or missing a Chavrusa to be Makar of somebody, or to give, whether it's to give a talk or just to be Makar of somebody, or going on trips where I'm going to be away from my family, although I think that may have, may have a, a, a different nuance and, and the like. So let me just share with you a, a vort, a beautiful, beautiful vort from the Chassam Seifer. Uh, the Tshuva's Chassam Seifer in the Hakdam et Yoridea, uh, starts with a drash in which Avram Avinu is referred to by, the, uh, by Hashem in the Navi Yeshayahu as Avram Oavi. Avraham is the one who loved me. And the Chazam Seifer points out that of all of the Avais, and really of all of the biblical personalities, Avram is the one who is described as the one who loved God. Why is Avram called the one who loved God? So the Chazam Seifer says, because Avram Avinu spent his whole life bringing Hashem to other people. Avram was the first, really, Kirov worker. Avram spent his whole life with Ovdei Avodah to bring them to Hashem. Now, surely, Avram could have separated himself from those Rishayim. He could have focused on his own spiritual elevation. He could have contemplated God through meditation, through prayer through removing himself from involvement with sinners. And yet, because he loved God more than he loved his own ego and his own accomplishments, he was willing, this is the Chazam Seifer, he was willing to sacrifice his own spiritual growth in order to make the name of Hashem beloved in the eyes of others. So the Chazam Seifer is clearly saying it's a great, great madrega 
to be willing to sacrifice even some of your own aliyah to be Makariv people. That's what you see from the, that's why the Chazam Sefer wrote this. Moreover, we have a similar point from Rav Yisrael Salanter. Rav Yisrael Salanter grew up uh, towards the beginning of the 19th century, the first third of the 19th century. And in Lita at the time, in Lithuania at the time, there were small groups of people, there were never large numbers, who were kind of hermits. They were called Prushim, and, and basically they kind of lived alone. They separated from their families for the whole week. They only came home on Shabbos. And they just concentrated. They were hermits on Torah, mitzvos. They were not involved with anybody. They didn't even talk during the week, uh, except it was the Torah. Mm -hmm. And Rav Yisrael Salanter was initially very, very attracted to a life which was totally focused on Avodah Sashem and spiritual growth. But then he decided that that's great for him. But what's happening to everybody else? Meaning, there's a responsibility to bring Hashem to other people. So he said he would give up his spiritual growth that he could get by isolation in order to be Makarif. So that is one side of it. Like everything else, there's always two sides of the, at least two sides of the story, somebody more than that. That is one side of the story, meaning, should I be willing to give up some of my ruchnias to be Makarif? The answer is yes, because you love God. And if you love God, you want to spread godliness in the world. It's both, an, it, it's both an expression of loving Hashem and loving your fellow Jew. It's a combination of both of those ideas. However, there is another side to the story. And that is, but what if this will have a detrimental impact on me? What if I'll become less religious? What if I'll become, right? It's like a broom, right? A broom wants to sweep up the dirt. But the broom gets pretty dirty, gets pretty filthy. Right? So what's going on here? So I think we have to be machalik between a person in the beginning of their career, so to speak, and after they've been learning for a while. When you, you have to give yourself time where your primary focus is on your spiritual growth. You got to absorb Torah. You have to learn halacha. You have to kind of be less involved in the world out there because you don't yet have that much to give. You have what to give. I don't mean to suggest everybody has what to give. But until you build yourself up sufficiently, there's too much of a danger that the non-religious world will have more influence on you than you will have on the non-religious world. So as a result, if somebody were to ask me, they're in yeshiva and they want to be involved in Kiruv, it really depends. I'm not saying it's an all or nothing. There may be different avenues in which you could still be involved, but you have to make your primary focus, your learning and your growth. And if that seems a little selfish, it's a selfishness that's an investment in yourself to then be able to give to others. When you've learned, when you've absorbed Torah, when you have a good knowledge, when you're very strong in your faith, then you're ready to give. Then you're ready to share then you're ready to even sacrifice some of the aliyah that you could have gained by focusing on yourself. But you've got to be careful not to jump too early. You make the jump too early, you may not have enough to give, and you may be adversely affected. Um, I'm sure people have heard over the years the famous mashal. They say it's of Aaron Cutler, but I think it's one of those mashalim that maybe many people have said that you've got to be like a kiddish cup that overflows, meaning to say you fill up the cup to the top, and then it overflows and fills up the surrounding cups. Your kirov should come from the abundance of the Torah that is within you. Now, I know there are different philosophies. Chabad may have a different philosophy here. Now, Chabad may have a philosophy, hey, as soon as you know the Aleph base, go out and teach. Again, I'm oversimplifying. I don't want my Chabad friends to. But th there is a philosophy that says, you know the Aleph base, teach the Aleph base. Okay, and, I, and I, I can understand that as well. Whatever you have, go out and teach it. But the other philosophy is that you need to build yourself up because there's a big challenge dealing with that environment. Now, the only thing is in your second example, 
there's another point I have to make as well. See, your second example about traveling away from my family. See, there you're dealing with a different Nakuda. That's not simply, I'm giving something up to be Makarev. Rather, I'm hurting my family in being Makarev. Now then you have to realize that when you have children, putting aside your wife even, when you have children, your primary obligation is to be sure that your children are getting what they need. And if that means to curtail your care of because of your kids, your kids have priority. There's no question. Um, you know, there was a great Rosh Hashiva from the Dati Liumi world, but a very, very a great man, Rav Aaron Lichtenstein, Zichron um, Olivracha. He, he was nifter a few years ago, and he was the Rosh Hashiva of uh, Gush Etzion, again, probably the, one of the preeminent uh, Dati Liumi yeshivas uh, in the country. And uh, he used to live in Katamon. I don't know if you've ever been. Katamon has the famous Shtiblach. They have a, a certain uh, minyanim in Katamon that are kind of around the clock and, and, and the like. And he used to live in Katamon. And uh, every Shabbos, he would spend a lot of time learning with his son. So somebody went over to him and said, Oh, you know, Rav Aaron, I'm so impressed that even though you run a big yeshiva, you make time to learn with your son. So he said, what do you mean make time to learn with my son? My obligation is to learn with my son. I make time to run a big yeshiva too. And that's a beautiful perspective. My obligation is to my children. And if they are taken care of, I then broaden what I can do beyond. But I can't use my activities beyond to neglect my children. So that's why your second example, you need that, that greater clarification. Yeah. During Shmona yesterday, sometimes rooms can get very crowded and... Sometimes what? I didn't hear. Rooms may get yeah. very crowded and I know, or I've heard you're not supposed to walk in front of or behind people. Yeah. But if you have something you have to do, such as welcoming, <laughs> et cetera, yeah. um, how far should you go to, like, to, to go do that mitzvah versus stay still? Yeah, th this is really, uh, it may be one of the hardest halachos uh, to keep. And, 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 and I, I always wonder myself, how were shuls laid out in the time of the Mishnah and the Gemara? This idea that you're not supposed to walk four amos in front of a person, four amos, that's six to eight feet. I'm not supposed to walk in front of somebody that is dominating Shmona Esrei. How on earth does that work? I mean, in any, in any minion, that is virtually impossible. It's virtually impossible. Unless you dive, well, I mean, some people are lucky. If I'm uh, diving in a certain position, maybe, but, but by and large, right? So what do I do? Now, they, t they tell a story about Rav Moshe. The Rav Moshe Feinstein, uh, after Mincha, had to go to a very, very important meeting. It was a very gedolim, a big, big, big meeting about a, a major issue in Klal Yisrael. And... He just wasn't moving. He finished davening, and uh, he wasn't moving. And people were saying, well, we, ha we have to go, we have to go, we have to go. And Rav Moshe couldn't do it because somebody was davening Shmon Esrei, and he would have to walk in front of that person. Rav Moshe said, there is a wall in front of me. This is like a stone wall. If I have to wait here two hours, I am going to wait here <laughs> two hours. So Rav Moshe took it absolutely very, very chomer. Lamaisa, we are mekel if you have a mitzvah, certainly, like duchening. So uh, in such a case, you're allowed to walk. Uh, the question becomes, but what if it's not a matter of duchening? What if it's just a question, I want to go to breakfast. <laughs> I want to I get out of here. Like, am I stuck to the last guy, you know, who's davening? So there, some people do have a leniency uh, if the davener, if there's a table in front of him. So the table might be considered a hepsik which would allow you to pass. So that would be a, that would be a heter. Uh, but it's, uh, the luck is very, very hard to keep. And if you can somehow circumvent and take a route uh, where you're not uh, walking in front of him within four amos, that would be the best thing to do. You, you try to keep it when you can. Sometimes it, it won't be possible. Yeah. I know the last time I asked you about a uh, question that turned into kind of a State of the Union on, uh, on Jewry specifically. Uh, this, <laughs> yeah. this one's going to be more about uh, another issue that, that is, is on the rise is specifically uh, divorces uh, in, in, kind of in, in the demon orthodox world. And so for that, what do you see as some of the cause of those, those marriages dissolving where once uh, the, 
Wash rate was quite yeah, low. Yeah. And then uh, second, just because we're in a room of, of, of often here, uh, in terms of advice um, for us or, or sources to go to in terms of building, especially early on, uh, you know, kind of good best practices for uh, you know, relationships and, and creating that early model uh, foundation for lasting success in marriage. Right, right, right. Well, you know, cer certainly it's the case that the divorce rate has risen in every segment of society. It's risen among Jews, and it's risen among Orthodox Jews. So you could be the most from, whether it's Hasidim, uh, Yeshiva. Now, Baruch Hashem, it is lower than outside of that, but it's really, really gone up high. Uh, even in our yeshiva, you know, there are, there are divorces that sometimes happen after less than a year uh, in, in marriage uh, and the like. So there are really two things. I think there's a general issue, and then there may be a specific issue that may apply to or Sameach populations and the like. The general issue is that people today, and I don't mean to be some grouchy old man lecturing, I mean, I'll include myself too, but you know, the good old days, you know. But people today, you know, <laughs> not like when I was growing up, people today are not used to working for things. We're used to instant gratification, you know. Our grandparents didn't always have idyllic, perfect marriages. They had problems too, and they had tensions too. Think about people coming here after the Holocaust and the like. But they understood that you work it out and you try to do what you can and life is not a bowl of cherries and I don't have to be happy all the time. Remember Fiddler on the Roof, uh, right? The question is, uh, do you love me, right? Remember the, the idea that, uh, well, what's love? 25 years, you know, I worked for you, and all, that, all that stuff. So there was kind of a sense of duty. There was a sense of commitment, meaning I'm not in it to be totally happy all the time or totally gratified all the time. We have a longer vision here and we're willing to work at it. What happened today is that in our, our ethic of that type of commitment is no longer here. We live in a throwaway society. If things don't work, you know, I mean, there used to be a whole industry of fixing things. In your slime, we still do it. You know, uh, you fix a phone, you fix a computer. Uh, that's not the mentality today. Today, you throw it out and get a new one. So that's been applied to marriage too, in which it doesn't work. I'm not happy today. Well, let's get rid of it. I want something else. And part of it is Hollywood, Hollywood culture. And part of it is Bechlal, a certain, a certain selfishness and egotism. And, uh, you know, looking after me, which is very pervasive, both for men and for women and, and the like. So, obviously, uh, you try to counter that with an education that stresses chinuch, that stresses responsibility. And the notion that in life there's going to be struggle. And in life, there's going to be hard work. And not every day is going to be a Sheva you know. Not every day is going to be exciting. But we stick to it because it's a commitment. Uh, you may want to check uh, Rabbi Victor Miller. Uh, Miller, Miller may be too strong sometimes. Uh, but uh, what he says about divorce, and uh, you stick to it no matter what. There's kind of a loyalty, not even to the other spouse. It's a loyalty to the marriage itself, like the, as if the marriage is a separate thing that i got to take care of. Now... With respect to the unique problems of Balei Tshuva, Balei Tshuva have maybe another problem. In addition to everything I just said, which applies to Baal Tshuvas like everybody else, I think a Baal Tshuva has another problem because their identity is not entirely uh, established yet. Mm -hmm. They're still in flux. They don't know exactly, depending on the person, who they are, where they fit in, and that, by definition, is going to introduce a certain tension in marriage. Because if I don't really know who I am, so I may marry somebody thinking I'm X, when in, and therefore I need someone X, when in fact I turn out to be a Y, and things change. And when my identity is in flux, and I don't have a clear picture of the type of life that I want and that is proper for me, so that's not a good time to get married. Now I know that marriage in the firm world is kind of a rite of passage, right? There's certain things you got to do. You know, uh, at a certain point in yeshiva, you get a black hat, and uh, then uh, whatever your way or it sits is out, and then you get married, right? There's a certain progression. It's kind of a checklist in which I check off the items of making it in the religious world. Well, when it comes to a hat, maybe that's harmless. When it comes to marriage, that's not a good thing. You can kind of look at marriage as something you got to check off on your list is sometimes a recipe for a very severe failure. So as a result, 
again, I mean, in a way, you know, early marriage is better than late marriage in many, many ways, in many, many ways. On the other hand, if a person's identity is not well grounded yet, they may be not ready to get married. And I think that's a source of a lot of problems in the Balchuva community. Mm -hmm. So there is the general selfishness and egotism that permeates society, and then there is the identity crisis uh, that a chosher b'tshuva. Of course, and people who are not b'tshuva may also have identity crisis. I'm not suggesting exclusively, but particularly when I'm making my first forays into religious life, I don't necessarily know where I belong and who I am, and therefore maybe I'm not yet ready to, to get married. Yeah. When Chazal would make certain gezeros or takanos, how did they get widespread so that everyone knew about them as soon as possible? Because communication was obviously way different back then, and like, did everyone have to wait for the new Sefer to come out, and then or whatever? Like, how did, it, how did it go that everyone knew what to do eventually? Yeah, that, that's a real, real good question. Uh, the issue of communication. Chazal, mainly the Sanhedrin in Yerushalayim, made takonos, they made gezeros, that are binding on the whole Jewish people. And now the Jewish people, many lived in Eretz Yisrael, but actually a majority of the Jewish people throughout the, uh, this period did not live in Eretz Yisrael. They lived in Bavel, they lived in Mitzrayim, they lived in Italy, they lived in other countries, they lived in Rome, they lived in other countries. Now, uh, you didn't have instantaneous communication, you didn't have uh, emails or faxes or WhatsApp or, or wh whatever it is, so there would be a lag time between uh, the date of a takana, the effective date of a takana, and the time that people would hear about it. Uh, the short answer is that they did send messages. We have in the Gemara itself uh, s stories of Rabbi Gamliel, sending, the head of the Sanhedrin, sending messages to the Gola about uh, Rosh Chodesh, and about uh, Yom Yom Tovim. So it did take time. Not only that, by the way, uh, there seems to be an interesting idea, and we, we know very little about operationally how it worked, that many Takanas and Gezeras were given a probationary period, because you actually find in the Gemara that certain Takanas were not accepted by most of the Sibor, or uh, it did not spread, Lohis Pashet, meaning apparently a lot of Takanas were made in a certain provisional way that they have to be accepted by the people, and they weren't always accepted, and then they would be repealed. So it would be fascinating that we just don't know the details of that. We don't know the mechanism. We don't know how much time did they allot for probation to see if the Tzibor is able to live with it or not to live with it. But those principles are, are there. Uh, yeah, in the back. were complaining for water wasn't necessarily a sin because they were, and they were very, very thirsty. I was thinking like a similar question also like here also. Like at the end of the day, if someone is being served for three times a day the same exact food, um, it would get difficult. Now, I'm not justifying the way they express <laughs> it, you know. Yeah. But I uh, know because I also say that they have different tastes and things that sort. But uh, what exactly a world was the sin? Uh, that's A. And B is that uh, why did Hashem decide to bring the Rishkua from the Nechashim that uh, attacked them, specifically to like a copper snake. Why did it have to be in, in that way? Yeah, so the question is that uh, we know that uh, throughout uh, the, the Chumash, B'nai Yisrael complain about uh, water and, and lack of food, and the Rambam lays down a fundamental idea that by hitting the rock, we're going to read in this week's Parsha, right, the great sin of Moshe Rabbeinu, Actually, Machlok is what the Aver is, but let's just go with the simple understanding of Rashi, that uh, Moshe hit the rock in anger and he was supposed to speak to the rock, or, or like the Ramban, he called them rebellious ones. Uh, and because of this, it was decreed that Moshe Rabbeinu cannot enter Eretz Yisrael. So the Rambam in the Shemona Prakim says that the real Avera was Moshe Rabbeinu got angry at the Jewish people. 
the hitting of the rock was a manifestation of anger. He wasn't thinking. Now, why was it a sin for Moshe Rabbeinu to get angry? So the Rambam writes, because the Jewish people didn't do anything wrong. Miriam died. The traveling well of Miriam stopped. They didn't have water. Somebody complains they don't have water? There is nothing wrong with complaining because they need water. So the, Ram, so the Rambam writes in the Shemayin Prakam, I, mean, I know I'm just giving you the background, that there is no sin for a person who is crying out because they don't have what they need to be alive. Now, so your question is, so why by the man, when they complained about the man, uh, obviously Hashem, Hashem was angry. Hashem was angry at them. And indeed Hashem gave them the slav, gave them the quail, uh, which resulted in their dying, etc., and the magefa. So what's the difference? So again, I mean, I mean, you're asking the question, but, 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 but I think you yourself said the difference. The difference is water is necessary for survival. The man gave them what they needed, especially according to Chazal, that it could taste like whatever they wanted it to taste like. They wanted steak, they wanted ice cream. <laughs> they didn't have ice cream in those days. It could be whatever they wanted, except for onions and garlic that affect uh, nursing. So I think, in a sense, wanting meat is a luxury. I, I, I think that's the, the Pashtus, meaning to say, if Hashem has taken care of you, but you're upset because you want more, all right, HaKadosh Baruch Hu has a taina that why don't you accept what Hashem gives you? Uh, Isaiah Washer has sameach b'chalkai. A wealthy person is happy with what he has. So to ask a kasha between not having water and not having steak, uh, you know, there is, a, there is a, big, a big, big difference there. Uh, Hashem expected them to be on a higher madrega. Isn't the parsha that they were asking for meat also? Asking for what? Isn't the parsha that they were asked, were they asking also for meat yet? Well, well uh, they may, may, may not have been asking for meat, but they were saying, we remember all the good, maybe they wanted a vegetarian diet, remember all the good food we had in Mitzrayim. <laughs> so they were saying, the man does not satisfy us. The man is monotonous. Now again, if you didn't have chazal that the man could taste like whatever they tasted, you know, maybe your taina would be, you know, be more of a taina. Even then, one would wonder because they could survive on the man. But if it could taste like whatever you wanted. By the way, there's a medrash plea, but now you... Um, a medrash plea is interesting. This just means an enigmatic medrash. It's in a regular medrash, but they, over the years, uh, Achronim compiled books of unusual midrashim. And one of the unusual midrashim is, it brings the story of the man, and it says, Mikan shemadlikin ner b'shabes. The complaint of the man is the source for lighting Shabbos candles. So what's the pshat? What's the shaykhas of complaining about the man with lighting Shabbos candles? The answer is very pashat. The man could taste like whatever they wanted. El amai, it didn't look good. Ah, so you see that part of enjoyment of food is what you see what you're eating, not just the taste. Therefore, you light Shabbos candles because that contributes to the Onik Shabbos of enjoying what you're eating. Of course, that would fit like the shitos that say that the main place where you light Shabbos candles is the Makam Achila, the place where you eat, so you'll be able to see the, see the food. Uh, yeah, yeah. The copper, uh, oh, yeah, the, co the copper snake. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. By the way, that, as you know, that is the uh, symbol of the American Medical Association, uh, the copper snake, uh, and that's from the Nechash Nechoshes. By the way, just to remind people, that Nechash Nechoshes was preserved in Klau Yisrael as a remembrance of that miracle until the time of Chizkiyo HaMelech, where he destroyed it. Mm. He destroyed it because people were turning it into a, an Avodah Zarah type of thing. So it was no longer a memorial of Hashem taking care of them. They turned it into an idol. Therefore, he felt he had to destroy it. Um, well, part of, part of the lesson of the Nechash HaNechoshes is that we have to understand that the maka of Hashem is ultimately itself the refuah, meaning whatever suffering Hashem sends us, 
is the source of the healing that will bring us to tshuva and introspection. So therefore, the, at least in, in representation, the very thing that was killing us is ultimately the thing that will bring us to a better place. And that's really a perspective on how you view Yisurin generally, that the trials and tribulations that I get in life are the vehicles of purification. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't want to assign fault. It depends on the situation. Sometimes the chazan is too low, and sometimes the gahal is too loud. But you're correct. It's a halacha in Shulchan Aruch based on the Gemara that you should try to modulate yourself with the, with the chazan. The problem is, though, once again, we get into, you know, each of us has our own amen style. So we, we, we tend to answer at a certain volume, modulation. Uh, but the chaz chazan will be a different chazan every time. So, so it's hard to consciously match up, but you try to match up when you can. Uh, yeah, in the back. Yeah. Um, so particular, this uh, particular question for people who um, maybe were, were, weren't always religious or weren't always as religious as they maybe become later. But whenever somebody um, does grow in life and then they have um, deep regrets about things that from the past that they now know and really feel were, were terrible sins. Um, how should they um, like make it uh, an immediate point to go about doing tshuva for those things or should they just focus on, on, on your, new, your new proper life on that growth? Don't, don't interrupt that to, 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 do tshuva, to do tshuva for the old life and just t take care of that by Yom Kippur, or should they say no, like, like it, you know, it was a serious thing, obviously, it's something that is serious things that, that maybe now you realize you have to do two before, should you stop everything and do two? And, um, and the second part of my question would be, and, and what about just not for um, two, but just for day-to-day -day things, not, not this bigger question of like big old hats. So yeah. When's the proper time to do two, but should you? Stop everything in the tshuva. Yes, yeah, so, so Rabbeinu Yaina says, Rabbeinu Yaina wrote uh, Zerishon. He was the nephew of the Ramban, and Rabbeinu Yaina wrote uh, the great uh, Sefer called Sharei Tshuva. But he then wrote a much shorter work called Yesoda Tshuva, which is like a very brief summary of the principles of tshuva. And if you look at the art scroll Machsor, uh, for Yom Kippur, you'll actually see a whole translation, the whole Yisoda Tshuva. It's a very short thing, like five pages, is uh, in the Art Scroll Machsar. And the first thing Rabbeinu Yonah says in Yisoda Tshuva is a very, very interesting thing. He says, the first step in coming close to Hashem by Tshuva is not to think about your past and regret it, but to forget about your past and look at this as the as the cliche goes, this is the first day of the rest of your life. Because if you think about things too much, then you get overwhelmed with your mistakes, you feel depressed, you feel guilty, you feel sabrachin, you lose your energy and you lose your impetus. And then you're mired in chait because your mind is so connected to that negativity. So he says that, he doesn't give you a time frame per se, but he says you first have to concentrate on building yourself up by generating light. You don't attack the darkness by taking a baseball bat and hitting the darkness. The darkness disappears by the light that you generate in positivity, in mitzvos and masim tovim. So he does suggest that you don't confront your past until you've built up a pretty strong foundation of Torah and mitzvos. Uh, you're well established in, in your path, and then you're ready to take on the challenge. Eventually, you've got to look back. Eventually, you've got to try to rectify. Eventually, you've got to confront the demons. But that's not the first thing you do. The first thing you do is your marbe, the or. So in truth, therefore, in the process of tshuva, there's a certain element of shikha. You put it behind you. You don't think about it 
And then you go back and you think about it, but from a position of strength and not from a position of weakness. That's psychologically a very, very important point, not to think about my sins that much, at least initially, because my job right now is to build myself up. And Rabbeinu Yona says, you should look at it as if you were born today. Today is a new beginning. What happened yesterday is not my affair anymore at this point. But again, as I say, in the long run, you do have to confront it. You know, it, it, it's hard to know. Every person has to do their own assessment. Uh, but, you know, and we, we could make mistakes. Sometimes we do it too early or too late. That's very true. But essentially, we try to understand ourselves. When are you, when are you strong? When are you good? When are you committed? When can you take looking back at a difficult past? And, you know, you try to do the best that you can and try, try to, uh, you know, know yourself well enough, and this is where, you know, uh, your rebbeim come in, and this is where your chaverim, if you have friends that you confide in, uh, chaverim can help you a lot in this, in this too. Sometimes, you know, we can't make the judgment call ourselves. We need to go outside ourselves a little bit. But at the end of the day, you have to be the one that makes that decision. Yeah? Um, oftentimes, Tosfos will quote Gemaras um, that are... I'm sorry, who will? Tosfos. Tosfos, yeah will quote other Gemaras and he'll make references to them and he won't bring enough um, context from the other places for us to ha even have any remote idea of what he actually is trying to say. When Tosfos compiled um, the work, um, was his expectation that we already know Shas, that we're able to <laughs> un know all these different things off the top of the head? Did he expect us to go and check it up, um, check up the, or did, did yeah. we simply not need to know those things that he's quoting and to understand the Tosfos without those um, sources. Anything. Yeah, that, that's a very excellent uh, question. Um, and now it is said, you know, the Bale Tosfos had yeshivos in France and Germany. They're called the Bale Tosfos. The founders of those yeshivos were the grandchildren of Rashi, like Rabbeinu Tam, but eventually there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Talmidim. And uh, that's why Tosos, by the way, were written by different people. The Tosos and Masechus Shabbos are not the same authors as the Tosos and Masechus Brachos. That's why it's Yadua that you cannot ask a contradiction from Tosos to Tosos unless it's the, a person, unless a person is mentioned, Rabbeinu Tam. But, but if it's a Tosos without a person, you know, written by different people over different times, right? So you can't ask a contradiction. Now, it is said, though, that the way the Tosos yeshivas were structured is each student was responsible to know an entire tractate. So if we're learning Bava Kama, I have 35 students in my shir. Your job is to know Brachos by heart, and your job is to know Shabbos by heart, and your job is to know Ervin and Gitten and Kedushin and Chulin. So every line we learn in Bava Kama, the Brachos guy could raise a kasha from Brachos, and the Shabbos guy could raise the kasha from Shabbos. And the Tosvas were compiled by the individual disciples mastering the tractate so they could ask any type of kasha or inconsistency from that tractate. Right? So you see that it may be that not every Talmud, at least at initial level, knew every tractate, but there was somebody in the Shir that did, and that was the basis of the Tosvas discussion. So what is expected of me, though? I'm learning a Tosvas, and I didn't learn all of these Masechdos, um, you know, you're right, uh, that, that's, that's a lot of extra work. Uh, you have to look it up. You have to try to figure out the passage. And you'll learn a lot. You'll learn a lot. I mean, that's why Tosis is a way of learning a lot of Gomorrah. <laughs> because in any Tosis, you might have to look up five or six or even more Gomorrahs and get into it. Now, without attacking the yeshiva system, this is actually a strong argument that uh, you should actually learn a lot of Gemara and Rashi before you even get to Tosos. I mean, let's imagine we had a different type of system in which we spent two or three years just doing Gemara Rashi without any Tosos at all. And you'd chazer it and chazer it and chazer it. So then you'll find, I mean, you didn't finish us, but you'll find that a lot of Tososim will not be so hard for you because you'll already know the Gemaras that are being referenced. In other words, this may be an argument in favor of extended plain Gemara learning as a preparation for Tosos. 
But if we don't do it that way, because we want to introduce Tosfos earlier, that means you're going to have to look it up. However, let me point out another thing, though. Depending on the Tosfos, it's hard to generalize. Sometimes you can learn a Tosfos without fully going through the proof text. In other words, Tosfos asks a question and tries to prove the question from the Gemara, and Tosfos gives an answer and tries to prove the answer from the Gemara. But sometimes it's only the nature of a proof, meaning you can follow the argument even without knowing the proof. It's like, I understand the question, I understand the answer, I didn't fully look at the proof text. Sometimes that is possible. It is possible to learn a Tosfos. I mean, it's the second best way of doing it. It is possible to learn a Tosfos without going into the proof because the proof is simply supporting a freestanding question and answer. However, that's not always going to work. Sometimes the question itself only makes sense by virtue of the proof text, and then you do have to look it up. You do have to look it up and spend time uh, in trying to understand what's going on. Other times you're, you are able to skip it and save it for later, later analysis. Uh, yeah? Are there, um, are there a lot of open references to Bar Kokhba throughout uh, Chazal? Yeah, are there a lot of references to Bar Kokhba? The answer is, the answer is no. Uh, the Bar Kokhba revolt, again, just to be sure people know what that is exactly. Uh, the Jewish people uh, waged a war against Rome between 66 and 70, which culminated in the Chorban Beis Hamikdash, where there was an attempt to overthrow Roman rule. Our Chachamim were not in favor of that war. Our Chachamim warned the zealot uh, Baryonim not to engage in that war, but uh, this was in violation of the Chachamim, and it resulted in Chorban. Now, the temple was destroyed, generally speaking, the year that we give, 70 of the common era. Between 68 and 70, 70 is the most common date that's given. Around 60 years later, 130, we had a second revolt. This is after the Chorban, led by Shimon ben Koziva, that Rabbi Akiva called Bar Kochba, the son of a star. Rabbi Akiva thought he was Mashiach. And this was a second attempt to overthrow Roman rule in Eretz Yisrael. Uh, Rabbi Akiva thought Bar Kochba was Mashiach. Rabbi Akiva actually began building a third base on Mikdash uh, under Bar Kochba. Bar Kochba was initially very successful. There were 900 villages that were liberated from Roman rule. I mean, they're small, but 900 villages. There are coins that were minted, Shimon ben Kuziva in the Sea Israel. And yet, eventually, what happened was, in 135, the Bar Kochba revolt was mercilessly terminated in Beitar, and uh, not, it's not, not modern Beitar, but it's a town that's called Beitar in the Gemara. And the casualties in the aftermath of Bar Kokhba were much, much worse than the Chorban Beis HaMikdash. Devastating, devastating casualties. So the question becomes, now remember, so that's 135. Chorban is 70, fall of Bar Kokhba, and the death of Rabbi Akiva, 135. The Mishnah was written around the year 200 after the Bar Kokhba revolt, right? So by the time the Mishnah is written, it's after Bar Kokhba at a time, at a temporary time, when conditions were relatively okay for the Jewish people. You know, went and came and went. So the question is, uh, does the Gemara make uh, detailed references to the Bar Kokhba revolt? The answer is no. Uh, it doesn't talk about it. The Yushalmi talks about it a little bit more than the Bavli. That's true. The Bavli, I believe, does not even mention, I have to check, but I believe the Bavli does not even mention Bar Kokhba as a person. I might be wrong. Uh, the Bavli talks about another guy who's called Bar Daroma, and it seems to be a pseudonym for Bar Kokhba, but there is no direct mention. And again, I, I here uh, I permit the hate mail to correct me if I'm wrong, because I, I can't say I'm 100% true. Uh, but I believe the Bavli does not mention Bar Kokhba by name, and all of the stories we know about Bar Kokhba are from the Talmud Yerushalmi, in Tainus, Masechus Tainus, and the like. And um, why Chazal don't talk about Bar Kokhba that much is very, very interesting. But they seem to have regarded it as a fiasco and a tragedy. And you're dealing with a difficult situation because you had Rabbi Akiva, the greatest of the Chachamim 
who put all of his eggs in the Bar Kokhba basket. And that decision resulted in tremendous, tremendous tragedy. I think the Chachamim had difficulty how to kind of, uh, how to understand. Well, what the Yushalmi brings, that when Rabbi Akiva said, Bar Kokh is Mashiach, so one of the Chachamim said to him, Akiva, grass will grow out of your hands in the grave before Mashiach comes. So don't, I mean, there were Chacham that disagreed with Rabbi Akiva, but Rabbi Akiva was the greatest. So, Lemaisa, this does raise a question, and I'm not prepared to, to really answer it. I mean, was Rabbi Akiva wrong? Did Rabbi Akiva make this awful, awful mistake that cost, well, the Gemara says millions of lives. All right, so the Mephorshim say it, it must be an exaggeration. But the numbers in the Gemara are astronomical. It's in the millions. Although, as I say, I mean, the Mephorshim say it, this was a guzma. So, the standard understanding was that Bar Kokhba potentially could have been Mashiach. The generation wasn't worthy. See, how do you, the, the Rambam's language is this. Rabbi Akiva thought Bar Kokhba was Mashiach ad sheneherag biavonos until he was killed because of sins. So there's a little bit of an ambiguity in the Rambam's formulation. Does he mean Bar Kokhba was killed because of our sins? Meaning, he was Mashiach, but Hashem took him away. Or does he mean Bar Kokhba had his own Averis, which shows he wasn't Mashiach? Which is actually a more difficult proposition because that would indicate Rabbi Akiva was totally wrong. So there are different ways of learning. One is, Bar Rabbi Akiva was right. Elamai, the generation, didn't rise didn't rise to the challenge. So historically speaking, it wasn't like Shabbat Tzvi where like, he went off the derech and started doing bad things, right? Well, as far as I know, the Yushalmi does not record him going off the derech except for the idea of uh, gaiva, meaning the idea of attributing. The one chait that is mentioned is the idea that we don't need God, you know, we're powerful enough to do this on our own, which would be the chait of gaiva. But it wasn't like Shabzai Tzvi who converted to Islam. It wasn't, wasn't, wasn't that particular story. So once again, um, Chazal kind of covered it up because they saw the dangers of false, false messianism as we see in Jewish history later. Uh, well, starting with Yashka himself <laughs> and then, of course, Shabzai Tzvi and a number of other cases. In fact, the Rambam has a whole letter about false Mashiachs uh, way before Shabzai Tzvi. Okay, uh, last question or finished? Okay. All right, thanks a lot and have a good day. Uh,